Welcome to the Using Docker track. If it's your first time here, uh, I'm Elton. I work for Docker, and I'm just doing the MC bit, so I'll be gone in a second. <laughs> uh, if it's not your first time here, then you know that, because I say that every time. Uh, we've got a fantastic session coming next. We've got Dan, who also works for Docker, uh, and who used to be a Docker captain, so he's gone from that level of community expertise to now joining the Docker, the Docker family. Um, and he's going to talk to you about networking, and this is going to be awesome. So uh, uh, a nice big hand for, for Dan, please. All right. Uh, thank you very much for attending this session. It is quite blinding up here, but I imagine that's par for the course for being up here. Um, yes, I was a Docker captain. I was a Docker captain for all of three months before I uh, jumped ship, as it were, and became part of Docker. So uh, I've been a Docker now for around three months or so, but I've been uh, a contributor to various open source projects and uh, various bits of the Mobi project for Docker for quite some time. So uh, I've kind of been around the houses, as it were, uh, with that. So why this topic? Um, you know, we were given the opportunity to put forward things that we thought that people would be interested to know about. So why, why did I decide that people might want to hear about this? Well, um, it doesn't take much to look around on the internet and see that there is still quite a few people continuously looking up and searching, how do I do this with networking? How do I do that? You know, how, what steps are required in order to uh, you know, just connect things together with containers? So it's quite clear that I think people want to know about this as a, as a subject. Uh, and then moving forward, as people are kind of getting together with their applications, they're moving them all together, and they want to build services, and they want to connect them together, how do they do those steps? So what's, you know, how do we move forward? What's the next steps there? So this is kind of a talk in two parts. The first part really is going to be uh, an introduction or an overview of the various Docker networking technologies. And then the second part of this, uh, is going to be a, uh, we're going to look at an application, a, a kind of a legacy network application. We're going to break it down into the various tiers, and then we're going to essentially replatform it using various Docker networking technologies. This is the agenda for the talk. So um, we're going to go through the evolving application networking uh, architecture, as it were. So we're going to look at you know, how applications have changed, how applications have typically been deployed, what they typically look like. We're then going to go into Docker networking, so we're going to look at the various technologies that you can make use of with deploying your applications in containers and connecting them all together. Then we're going to look at some infrastructure design patterns, so you know, deploying Docker, you know, what steps can you take when you're configuring the platform that the Docker engine is running on? So some of the key design, uh, design patterns there that can help you take advantage of things like security and segregation. Then we're going to look at the design patterns when modernizing an application. So we're going to take an application and we're going to break it down into tiers. We're going to look at which networking makes sense for which particular part of that application. You will notice there is a section on here that says redacted. Now, I'm hoping uh, you were all awake in the keynote yesterday, or you've been on the internet in the last 36 hours or so. Uh, you will be aware that there were some announcements made. So I'm going to cover um, some topics around that. Um, yeah, so that's going to be towards the end. And then a summary of kind of all of the bits that I've covered today and hopefully some time for some questions at the end as well. So um, let's, let's kick it off. Let's look at the evolving architecture of application networking. So, you know, rewind maybe nine, ten years or so, a lot of applications were physically hosted. What that means is typically one server, one application, one operating system. It was a very one-to-one -one design, and that typically gave, uh, you know, from a networking perspective, there are a lot of things to be considered there. Every application required an IP address, for instance, um, but everything was pretty flat, and networks typically were used at physical separation through things like ports, through VLANs. They were used to segregate multiple applications that had shared infrastructure, and then the high availability for these applications, typically, uh, you know, expensive clustering software where you would have you know, applications monitored by uh, these, these third-party bits of software, and then DNS and load balancer between sites. So uh, this is the first of many networking diagrams for today. This is just a kind of a quick overview of what a physical application, uh, a physical application deployed would look like. So um, to the left, we've got tier one, tier two, or to the right, if you're looking over here. Um, yeah. <laughs> These are basically, yeah, a number of servers would be deployed. You'd have a number of applications on there, and then there would be a load balancer that's shared between all of those applications all running on those physical servers. 
And then for things that required high availability, so things like databases, you typically would have an abundance of hardware where the application or the database would typically only run on one of those servers, and then you'd have the expensive clustering software which would monitor the state of these things. So if the server fails or if the application falls over for whatever reason, the application then will be redeployed over on the secondary bit of infrastructure that you've deployed over there. So that's kind of a quick overview of kind of some of the more traditional or physically hosted applications. So either spread one-to-one -one across multiple bits of tin or kind of looked after in a high availability scenario uh, with kind of an abundance of hardware sitting there waiting to capture that running, well, to restart that process in the event that its original host goes down for whatever reason. Moving forward, uh, as technology has improved, there was a huge explosion around a decade ago where virtual machines, well, uh, where physical servers were getting to the point that they were so large that it made sense to come up with a way of compartmentalizing your applications into virtual machines on those servers. Um, this was fantastic for breaking up applications and making things much easier. However, a lot of the design for those applications typically caused an explosion of resources across your network. You, you move away from one physical device having one physical IP, each of those physical devices still has that address. But then every virtual machine that you're running on there, and there could be 10, hundreds of virtual machines, they all become IP addresses on the network as well. You need ways of segregating all of those. There's a lot of things to take into account there. So this typically is a very small example of virtual infrastructure. You can see that to segregate various applications or various tiers, we make use of VLANs, and all of those need to be presented down to those virtual hosts. And then all of those virtual machines all require an address on the network. They all require connecting to the correct network as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things to consider there. And if applications want to move around or you need to scale out your servers, services and servers, you know, the networking team needs to be involved as well. So just adding in more uh, additional capacity here means going to the network administrator and getting that person to ensure that the networks that are required are also presented there as well. So an abundance of network um, IP addresses, an abundance of overcomplicated networks just to provide that segregation, and then all of those additional tasks handed down to your network administrator for him to ensure that, you know, your infrastructure um, is all configured correctly as well. So that was kind of the case um, well, around four years ago when a, a technology company kind of appeared that championed containerization. So kind of moving forward, how can we move away from that a little bit to simplify things, to make things a lot easier? We're going to look at the various Docker networking technologies that can make you know, the network administrator's life easier, as well as the administrator of the application's life easier as well. So, welcome. This is my terminal for today. Uh, I'm kind of cheating here because I don't need to do everything live because I've got it all here. So this is my DockerCon terminal. Uh, and if I'm using Docker networks, I can quite easily see those networks just by doing a Docker network ls. So we can see here bridge networks, host networks, the overlay network, and also the Mac VLAN network as well. There is one mentioned on here, which is the null network. I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail about that, but essentially if you create a container and connect it to that null network, I quite imagine you can imagine where that traffic's going to go. Yes, that's right, you've black holed your container. There, there are reasons for this, so things like IoT devices that are essentially just doing processing and don't require any network connectivity, you would do that. You would give them some workload, connect them to no network, for instance. So uh, we'll start to drill down into these various networking technologies. First one we're going to look at is, um, first two we're going to look at actually are host and bridge networking. These are the simplest networks. These kind of come out of the box. So I've got three hosts here. Um, the first host, I'm going to create a container on, and I'm going to use host networking. Host networking is quite simple. Essentially, when you create a container and connect it to the host network, you are connecting it to the host's network. <laughs> what that means is that essentially the, when the process comes up in a container, it will essentially attach its ports that, you want to expo that it's exposing to the host's network. So shares a TCP IP stack, shares the host's namespace. 
The only real difference that you're getting here is you're getting that segregation by having it run in a container. So starting to move forward into bridge networking, if I just run containers without connecting or exposing anything, by default, they will connect to the bridge network that comes as part of Docker. What that means is when you install Docker and start the daemon up, inside your Docker host, there is a bridge network that is created by default. And it is just sat there waiting for containers to connect to it. So when you start a container, it is given an internal IP address. So you can see uh, on the second host, the gateway address, which is just underneath the, uh, the bridge um, NAT uh, device. And then all of the containers that are created will, will start and give, be given an IP address in that range. Now, that's great. All of the containers that are connected to that bridge can speak to one another. Nothing can speak to them, and they can't speak to anything outside of that bridge network. So it is an isolated network that lives inside that one particular host. So that's, that's great. Um, everything can speak to one another internally, but you know, we've got services that we want to share to the outside world. We want to expose that. So just doing a Docker run, and then using the minus P flag, we can say which port on the host we would like to advertise the following post after, uh, port after the colon that is being shared by that container. So in this example, uh, we have an Nginx container that we've started on the third host. That was always sharing port 80. However, what we've asked for is the host to have a port 80 uh, shared and then to have that connected back to, the, uh, to that container. At which point then, you've essentially created a traffic link between that. You're exposing uh, that port to the outside world. You don't necessarily have to do identical ports, so I could do minus P8080, colon 80. And what that will do is that will map port 8080 on the host to port 80 on the container itself. So kind of a degree in flexibility there in how you want to expose your services. The key concept really here is though, and for kind of best practices, only expose the services or the ports that you should be exposing. There is no point exposing everything if there's no need to. You're just opening yourself up to, uh, you know, for, for security reasons. That doesn't really make that much sense. So, um, bridge networking and host networking, both of those are single host only. What that means is that containers that are created on there, they can speak to one another on the bridge and you can expose ports to the outside world. But if you have a number of containers on host one, and a number of containers on host two, how do they speak to one another? So the technology behind that is overlay networking. Again, this comes as part of Swarm. So whenever you create a cluster and basically do a Swarm join, every node will become part of that overlay network. So um, quite easy. There are a number of ways we can actually do this. We can essentially do a Docker network create minus D uh, for driver, overlay, and then a name that we'd like to use. Alternatively, if we just do a service create, that will automate the process of creating that overlay network, and then it will create the containers on top of that network as well. So a very simplistic way of doing um, the full deployment of an overlay network. So the technology, or how this works, it makes use of VXLAN, and essentially that is a tunnel network that lives on top of the underlay network. It's quite simple. It's all part of the kernel. It's all part of, um, yeah, it's all part of the Linux operating system. So we're just making use of features that already exist. It's very simplistic. And any host that is part of an overlay network, sorry, any container that is part of an overlay network can speak to one another. So traffic can span between containers regardless of what host that they're actually on, as long as they're connected to that overlay network. So by default, the overlay network is encrypted. The key is rotated automatically every 12 hours as well. So you get additional security. You get segregation. And also, when you, um, when you create a service and you expose a port on it, as I showed before, with the minus P and the exposing port and the internal port that you would like to expose, traffic can be routed to a task regardless of where it is. So what that means? is that, for instance, on the middle host, my, my task, my container isn't actually running. 
However, that's the host that the load balancer has given me. I've connected to its external port, and the overlay network takes care of routing that request to one of the hosts inside the swarm cluster where that container is actually running. So we get the capability of, of having um, you know, infrastructure that is bigger than the service that we're running. We also get load balancing, so every time that there is a request, the overlay network and swarm will take care of moving to the next particular task and moving its way through them. So you get load balancing and routing to where those tasks actually exist. So a little bit more kind of, I know this is um, using Docker, but I'm going to give a little bit more internal detail of how that actually works. There are two IP addresses that are given to each container when they're created on an overlay network. There is an internal, um, so the, the 10.0 address here, and those are containers, those are IP addresses that exist on the overlay network. So those are the IP addresses that a container will use when, they want, when it wants to speak to another container. Internal only addressing. The second address is the VXLAN VTEP endpoint address. And it is this address which allows traffic, even though it thinks it's on the same network, to drop onto the external network and be routed to another VTEP endpoint through the VXLAN tunnel where that task is running. So if a container at the top wants to speak to the container at the bottom, it will be using the external address. That traffic will then be pushed out through that box and routed to 10.0.0.3 where it will go through the tunnel, back out, and the traffic will then be presented to that container. So essentially just a simple overlay that exists on the physical overlay, underlay, sorry. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, a kind of a quick overview of kind of swarm networking, overlay drivers. Uh, one of the newer features that was added a few releases ago was Mac VLAN. So Mac VLAN, as the name kind of suggests, is kind of more of a hardware concept or a hardware way of creating a container and giving it things like a MAC address. So a MAC address is essentially a, a hardware uh, address that is usually a, a printed into the, the BIOS or the firmware of each network card that you would buy. And it's a unique address which identifies a physical device on a network. So what this means is that we can now have a container that is directly connected to the underlying network. So why, why would you do this? I mean, we can, we can expose everything we need to do over overlay networks. We can expose simple services through bridges. Well, if you need to connect things to a direct network for things like VLAN access, or they require, uh, they, they're required to be looked after by IPAM software, or things such as that, then direct access to the underlay network, is this uh, Mac VLAN, is that's what it's going to get you the containers essentially become a first-class citizen on the network. This is quite simple to set up. Essentially, where you create a network, so with this, we're doing a network create. I'm using the Mac VLAN driver. We're specifying the subnet, so um, some applications, for instance, will have, could be coded with static IP addresses in them. They could have requirements where they need to connect to devices that already have ranges in them that, you know, we can't change the firewall, for instance, or the endpoint has a requirement for a static connection. What this allows us to do is it allows us to move an application that we can't modify into a container and make it look exactly like it did before. So with this, um, we create a network, we tell it which range we're going to do, and we also tell it which Ethernet adapter to connect to as well. Now, this is a little bit important because um, that Ethernet adapter that it requires connectivity to, promiscuous mode is required. The reason for that is you're going to have what was a single uh, network device suddenly looking like multiple network devices on the network as well. So you may have issues with some switches if they're not allowed to have a connection that shares multiple uh, MAC addresses. However, if you've been running things like virtualization and, and things like that, typically your switch will be allowing multiple MAC addresses on the same connection. So we've created that network. We've told it which Ethernet adapter we want to use. So this is the Ethernet adapter that we will bind new MAC addresses to. If we want to make use of VLANs, it's, a, it's a, as shown in the kind of the example up above there, we would make use of a sub adapter which is connected to that VLAN. And then finally, we have that network created. It's then just a case of when you do a Docker run, 
We tell it the network that we want it to use, so in this case, the Mac underscore net network, which I created the previous example, and we can tell it to use a physical IP address in the range that we specified before. This means that this Nginx container that I've just spun up here will have, will, will be connected to the underlying network. Anything that is monitoring the network will suddenly become aware of a new device that's connected to that network. If it was a different application in this container, it can look exactly like the previous, the previous application did because it's connected in the same way to the network. There are a few issues with this as a design pattern. You don't want to have every container having its own IP address. There is no benefit to doing that. And the fact that containers are tiny and you can spin many of them up very quickly, you could effectively do a bit of damage to your network if you're not being careful. So, you know, it's great that this is a, a way to have, you know, applications that typically require direct access to the network. We can put those in containers. We can make them look like first class citizens on the network. But do be aware that this gives you a lot of the overhead that we're trying to get rid of from you having multiple virtual machines everywhere. With this, you're going to have a lot of IP addresses all over the network. And anything that monitors the network or anything like that could start screaming. And your network administrator might not be too happy with you either. And then finally, networking plugins. So all of the drivers that I've mentioned today, the bridge, the host, the null, if you're so inclined to not connect to anything, uh, the overlay, Mac VLAN, they're all part of the Docker engine. However, um, the, one of the key features of the Docker engine is we've tried to make it as plug and play as possible. With that, there is a capability, and we do have a number of plugins that third party vendors have created, which allow a number of different functionalities. So, uh, some of the key ones are their own IP address allocation management, so they take charge of giving IP addresses to containers. Um, some of the other drivers allow you to do clever things where when you spin up a container, the driver will be able to speak to pre-existing networking equipment and do things such as uh, quality of service between containers and between hosts. Or it can create its own overlay tunnels. It can do all manner of things like that. So what this allows you to do, uh, when you, the life cycle of a container, so the starting and the stopping of it, rules can be pushed up to physical networking devices when that container is created. And when that container is gone, those rules would be removed as well. So you get the automation and the life cycle, not just from a container perspective, but also from a networking configuration perspective as well. Uh, so onto infrastructure design patterns. So this is uh, one of the newer features that was added into Docker 17.03 or, or 1.13. Uh, essentially, the capability of segregating uh, your control plane and your data plane. So for security reasons, this makes, uh, this, is a, uh, you know, this makes perfect sense. When you have a host that has multiple network adapters, you have the capability of binding the control plane, so the swarm commands and you know, the bit that you connect to when you want to do Docker runs and tell the Docker engine what you would like it to do, and then the data plane. So communication between containers will be forced out of a different set of network interfaces. As I mentioned, this provides logical and physical separation, so pretty straightforward. The only real key difference here is when you do a Docker Swarm init, we say which adapter we want to um, advertise, so that will be your control plane, and then we say which adapter is going to be the data plane, so which adapter is going to carry all of the traffic that our application makes use of. And once we've done that from the Swarm Manager perspective, it's kind of the same for just adding all of your additional workers as well. So when you do a swarm join, it's a case of just making sure that you add in the two additional flags which say this adapter is carrying this particular type of traffic and this adapter is carrying the other type of traffic. Once you've done that, any containers that you create and add them to that overlay network, all of their traffic now will only go down that data plane, go through those data plane interfaces. So complete physical and logical separation. So that's some of the design patterns for infrastructure. We're now going to look at some of the design patterns when you take an existing application and migrate it to make use of Docker networking. Just quickly, um, 
Because we're taking an existing application, we're going to be using Docker Enterprise Edition. There are some key features as to why we're going to do that, um, mainly support, but also we're going to make use of things like uh, the universal control plane. So what this allows us to do, we can either do uh, all the commands that I've done manually today in my super fake terminal, or we can actually use um, you know, things like services, so full service definitions and compose the full stack, as it were. And then we're also going to make use of the Docker Trusted Registry as well. So on here, all of our containers will be scanned, and we can only deploy them when we know that they've been uh, certified and they've gone through all of those policies. So this is the platform that we're going to use to deploy our application. We're going to take an existing application and move it onto here. So this is my application. It's pretty straightforward. It's a bit of an amalgam amalgamation of the first two uh, architectures that I pointed out. But quite simply, we have a number of services that have been migrated to virtual machines. And then the database is still living on some physical infrastructure. So you will tend to find that this is kind of a bit of a common architecture that you'll see in a lot of places where they still haven't migrated their database to virtualization for whatever reasons. It makes use of a number of um, VLANs to do the segregation between the tiers. And also in the VLAN tier, so we have the, these two uh, virtual machines, they require some deep access to the network. So we have things like ensuring before data goes into that database, we remove credit card numbers, or they scan the network to provide security uh, for security reasons for, secu uh, you know, for obscure traffic and things like that. So we've got a full kind of complement of various tiers and various networking requirements. So whilst I was showing you the architecture, the, the behind the scenes, the developers and our application maintainers, they've been busy at work and they've, you know, they've repackaged all of the applications that we can into containers. Great job, everyone. So let's start breaking this down. We're going to start by looking at the, the first two tiers, so the, the front end and kind of the app tier. As I mentioned, uh, you know, you've got a lot of virtual machines, you've got a lot of VLANs that do all that sort of segregation. The key concept here is that we're going to use some Docker networking technology to simplify that architecture. We're going to simplify the networking configuration, and we're going to get security through isolation. So the services that we need, we can isolate those through overlays, through VXLAN tunnels. And then we're going to get the security that we need through that encryption on that overlay. And then we can start to reduce some of the networking configuration overhead for the physical devices as well. So we can move away from having VLAN sprawl throughout our infrastructure. So looking at the front end of this, this application, what we're going to make use of is we're making use of a function that is part of Docker EE. So I mentioned previously the um, swarm overlay and how that does routing. Well, with Docker EE and the universal control plane, we get additional functionality with a bit of technology called the HTTP routing mesh. And what this allows us to do, so for instance, if we have multiple front ends or multiple uh, like websites that we're, we're exposing, the HTTP routing mesh will allow us to have those in separate services. And as traffic comes into those exposed ports, it will route the traffic to the correct service dependent on, its, uh, dependent on the host name that we're requesting. So this allows us to share networking ports between different services as well. And then once we've been routed to the correct service, then we also get all of the load balancing and routing that the overlay network provides as well. So we're essentially getting functionality on top of functionality and scaling and moving away from kind of VLAN sprawl and all of that overhead there. So, We've taken our packaged applications, our new applications. We've deployed them using overlays and HTTP routing mesh to give us multiple additional functionality. With our applications here, the mid tier, we can just make use of simple swarm overlays. So we take those um, you know, scalable applications, and we can get scalable services now. Because we don't need to worry about having to do all that configuration of every host. All we need to do is ensure that the host can communicate with one another directly. So as long as it's part of a swarm cluster, we can take that repackaged application, make it into a service, and scale it up and deploy it as we see fit. So completely scalable services. And then we also get the benefit of being able to load balance between all of those existing services as well. <laughs> 
If we move on to kind of the back end and some of the more physical services, so we're looking at the database and the um, and these existing uh, virtual machines that have some low-level functionality. Now, this database is huge. We're going to leave it as is. However, we need access to it. So how are we going to go about doing that sort of thing? Well, we're going to look at how we can preserve those existing integrations. We have some virtual machines that were essentially sitting on the network. They were scanning HTTP traffic or just all traffic moving around. Well, using Mac VLAN, we can take that application and attach it directly to the network and give it the same functionality, except now we can manage it all by Docker as well. So we don't need to have that virtual machines everywhere. We don't need to have um, yeah, all of the extra steps there. And we can connect it directly to the network or to the VLAN where it needs to see that traffic. And then some existing in-house applications that were built with the static IP address requirement, or we just can't, well, all they need to sit on that same network we can essentially create, uh, create an IP address for that host, put it back onto the same network in a container, and it will have access to all of the networking resources that it required before. So we've essentially taken the front end, we've taken advantage of HTTP routing mesh, we've taken advantage of overlays to separate out that application into separate um, web servers or web services. We've taken the app tier and we've taken it in its original form. We've moved that into a service and we're exposing it through overlays and through exposed ports that are mapped back up to the front end. And then the, the deep services that are required to look after the database tier, we've managed all that by making use of Mac VLAN. So what are the design patterns for all of this? You know, well, where possible, there is a lot of opportunity here. So you, know, you can start to remove a lot of that complexity that exists in your networking infrastructure but we get the same functionality that we had before. So making use of VXLAN to give you that segregation between your applications and between your application tiers. And also we get for free um, AES encryption on that VXLAN as well. So not only is it segregated, it's also encrypted. And then the cases where we have that hard pinning or a requirement for VLANs, we can make use of Mac VLAN to put those applications in containers but still present them to the network in a way that they can still operate in the way that they were designed to, to begin with. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot more of this that you can actually get some hands-on experience with as well. So if you do have time, a lot of the labs will actually run you through uh, building up services and actually deploying them through composing and connecting them to networks. So if you do have time, um, that's there for you. So this is the redacted bit. Um, there's a Kubernetes logo on there, so that probably it gives you a clue as to why it was um, redacted to begin with. Disclaimer. So we will have time for some questions, I believe. However, this is a very high-level overview of the design patterns that you may uh, come across when working with Kubernetes and Swarm together. Other than that type of topic, I'm not really going to be able to answer a lot of questions around that. So uh, if you can forgive me for that, the rest of the topic I can quite easily cover questions for. So. That's my get out of jail free card for that particular topic, so I'm sorry about that. So, what does it look like? At the moment, we have UCP. We deploy services through either the UI or through the CLI, through the CLI bundle. So when we push services to UCP, um, you know, through, through Swarm and through the, through the various hosts that are connected to that, those services will just be spun up in overlay networks, simple as. When we deploy um, services through Kubernetes, it's the same thing, except the Kubernetes managers will speak to the kubelets that run on each of the hosts. It will push the config down to them. And again, dependent on the networking driver that you wanted to make use of, you could end up with overlays or you could end up with bridge networking on each host. That is entirely down to you. However, the concept is pretty much going to be the same. Through UCP, push your services either have them spin up as a swarm cluster, have them spin up as a Kubernetes cluster. Great. But now the question is, I have some swarm services over here and I have some Kubernetes services over here. Yeah, how do I get them to speak to one another? So the key design behind this at the moment is that we're going to make use of a layer seven ingress controller. And this essentially, like the HTTP routing mesh that I showed you earlier as part of UCP, this essentially will allow a way for 
uh, you to speak between services dependent on which service, dependent on which orchestrator or platform that they live on. So this essentially is going to be the way that when you hit a front end, the traffic is routed to the correct service. So you can see quite clearly, if I hit the swarm.dockercon.com, I'll hit that ingress controller, and my traffic will be routed down to the service that is currently running on my, my swarm cluster. Same with Kubernetes. If I hit kube, traffic is routed down to the um, services that are running on my kube cost, cost cluster. Sorry. Speaking between the two, essentially, your service that's running on Swarm will just be, need to be told when it needs to speak to that service, speak to cube.dockercon.com, and that layer 7 ingress controller will route the traffic to that. So that's basically how it's going to work. It's essentially just going to route the traffic to the place where it's actually running. So that's a quick overview of UCP and Kubernetes and how you would have the two speak to one another. Um, a summary of my session. So applications that can be rehomed, applications that we can make changes to or move to different networks, you can make use of a myriad of Docker networking technologies and features that's going to make it a lot easier for deployment and a lot easier for their scaling as well. Uh, the overlay networks, they pretty much give you the same functionality that you're going to get from things like VLANs, but additional functionality from having encryption by default. So you can have all of the segregation between applications, between tiers, all done through that overlay network. And then services that are tied or hard-coded and can't be changed particularly much, you know, their specific network requirements, well, they can still be deployed in containers because they can make use of the Mac VLAN driver. So with that, um, slides I was told to put in. <laughs> So, uh, you know, a lot of today, a lot of this applies to MTA, so migrating those applications. You know, you need to be aware of the networking technologies that are going to help you deploy those applications. So, if you want to know more, the Docker booth is 20 meters that direction. Um, and also, if you want to play with Docker EE, have a look at the HTTP routing mesh or de deploy some test services in there. Um, you can get a trial as well, so that URL will get you a demo for you to play with. And with that, so that was Practical Designs in Docker Networking, and thank you very much. Cool. Hello. Hello. No. Well, I told you it was going to be fantastic, and it certainly was. Thank you very much, Dan. That was awesome. Uh, so we've got a few minutes for questions. Uh, if you've got a Hello. question, raise your hand or go up to one of the mics. Hello. Oh, Hello. Oh dear. Hello. Is this thing on? It is. All right. OK, so uh, I've looked at a number of other solutions, and I was wondering if Docker UCP provides solutions for SSL multiplexing, termination, and, and load balancing of connections at the front end? That's a very good question. Um, so there are a number of things that you can do there. The, the thing that you may end up with is load balancing on load balancing. Um, but you can do, when you create a service, uh, you can pass all the SSL certificates to that service and have that as your endpoint, and then that will be your level of termination there. Or if you need to, you can terminate much higher up if that's your network so architecture. I was wondering, does UCP provide that facility? I've looked at things like uh, OpenShift, for example, and there's yeah. you know, native SSL multiplexing and termination in there. Are you able to offer equivalent built-ins? Yeah, as part of a... I'm not actually sure with HRM, uh, because it, it, it just uses a, it's just a software proxy. So it's a proxy sitting in the service that runs yeah. al alongside the swarm as the rest of it. So like, we do the initial configuration of saying this is where the, the, uh, the, the, this is the, this, the, the DNS name and route it to this service. But then you can go and configure it uh, yourself. So I'm not sure if we do that SSL stuff, but it's just a service. So you can, uh, you can extend you. it. Okay. Right in the middle, right in the middle of the room. <laughs> uh, so uh, if I have uh, containers um, with overlay network communicating only with each other using SSL today, should I just uh, remove the, the SSL layer because uh, the overlay network already adds encryption? That's a very good question. I mean, you do have encryption on top of encryption. I don't know if there's a limit on how much encryption one should have, but um, essentially that's really down to if there's overhead uh, from doing that sort of thing. I mean, you can disable the SSL encryption on the overlay uh, and then just still have your, um, your containers speaking to one another through that SSL or disable it in your application. 
the idea behind a lot of the program is that we don't want to change people's applications. So um, it's entirely up to you. The, you. You have the option of doing it either way. But yeah, overhead is really the the main key for why you would want to possibly turn one of them off. Yeah, I think I think possibly your your SSL inside the container is probably more expensive than the encrypted overlay network uh, in compute terms. But yeah, yeah, I think you would have to test that out. Yeah. Is that yeah. A question over here? Um, you mentioned that uh, using the MacVLAN uh, driver, um, containers become first-class citizens of the network. Does that mean I'm not limited to TCP anymore? As far as I understood, uh, yeah. well, yes. Uh, the, good, the question there makes sense, but the problem that you have is that Docker is taking care of uh, configuring that for you. Yeah. So Docker is always going to attach an IP address to it, and it's going to be TCP IP as your communication method. I so was thinking about UDP and uh, uh, it's still IP, but not yeah, you TCP. can send UDP traffic over MacVLAN. So oh, cool. Yeah, if you if you've got a DNS server or something that's serving out IP addresses, for instance, that MacVLAN. Thank you. Cool. And I think we're out of time, actually. Yeah, uh, we okay. can do one more. You want to do Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. One question. Um, session stickiness yes. uh, in between the HTTP ingress controller. Yep. There are a lot of applications. They need um, stateful sessions and stateful applications. And how are you going to deal with it? So the way that you deal with that, yeah. I had a feeling somebody was going to ask this question. Yeah, so I without having load balancer after load balancer, because there's a little bit problem. And, and yeah. the overlay mesh is. A mesh, yeah. And yeah. So the key way that you do this at the moment is when you configure a service in UCP, yeah. um, you can essentially set um, cookies in the header that you would like to use, okay. and UCP will use those to ensure that the same route is taken to the same task. So you will get that stickiness oh, based great. upon a session ID or a cookie okay. ID that you have as part of that HTTP request. It's interesting because the ingress problem is occurring every day, and yeah, it's a nice technology. So, <laughs> thank you, Buster. Are, are you going to open source it? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know either. You because above my pay grade. Because that's... there's no ingress controller on the net, you have to build it on your own, like we do it. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, you have stateful applications that you have to route the sessions to the correct container. Yeah. So, you have to do it on your own at the moment, and therefore it's. An, Interesting. That's a very good question. Yeah. It's a good reason to upgrade to Docker EE. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Dan. Uh, another big hand for Dan, please. And he's around. So if you've got any questions, Thanks. ask him. Up.